Let me tell you about the time that my little sister read me like a book. She really told me about myself. She said you were like this because of this. And I need you to do this, that, and the third to improve for the better. I, I, I had never felt so analyzed. Here's the context. I called my sister after a disagreement with my girlfriend. Here's the story for the disagreement, which led to the phone call, which led to me getting my life scraped. Then my girlfriend had just gotten downstairs to the kitchen, about to get the day started. She opens up the back door. All of a sudden, the alarm starts blaring. We forgot to disarm the alarm system before opening the door. And immediately, she went into go mode. Okay, where's your phone? Wait, no, where's my phone? Because we need to... Wait. Meanwhile, I'm standing next to the staircase like... Oh yeah, my phone's upstairs. I don't know where your phone is though. The alarm is blaring. And we need to turn it off. She's in full go mode. I am not. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this ain't a real emergency. Like I watched her open up the balcony door. It's okay. So she's gonna go upstairs, find her phone, it's on the alarm, and we good. She's still like, why aren't you moving? Where? Like, come on, let's. And then I'm just here. Like, you just going You going run Pat? Are you gonna go upstairs? Too? Okay. All right. I'm. I'm just gonna go over here to this panel and see what's up. She gets back downstairs after turning off the alarm from her phone and she is pissed. Meanwhile, this is me. Let me look at this panel and see, you know, this. so this is how it really works. What's the code to this alarm so you can commit it to memory so like next time we can just do it from the panel. But she wants nothing to do with me at this point. I sense it. I say, all right, so like what? what's the code and then once we figured out what the code was that led to the deeper discussion about why that whole event was a problem. In short, she said, it's moments like these when your lack of urgency pushes me to question my trust in your ability to handle real emergencies. That took all of the wind out of my sails when she said that. In my mind, I was like, wow. That, that's a lot, bro. Cause when somebody has to question their trust in you to do anything, big or small, that takes a lot to get back on an equal footing. That takes a lot to reinstill trust in somebody who lost it or was on the fence about it to begin with. That's with anything in life. About an hour after me and my girlfriend's conversation, I called my sister. She dissected that event like a sports analyst. She wasn't even there. My sister read me for filth. She said, your lack of urgency stems from your adolescence. When you thought it was so cool to be slower paced, nonchalant, that same mentality spilled over into the rest of your life and it will continue to spill over unless you control it. It doesn't have to be the only dimension of your life that shapes how you move and operate when things are under control or when things are on fire. You can be cool, calm, and collected and still have some urgency about you. She said, you have been fighting so much against being labeled anxious or being nervous or being stressful or being stressed out. You've seen how stress impacts other people and you said, no, 
I do not want to look like them. I don't want to be like that. I don't ever want people to see me in that light. So you've taken that calm, cool, and collective persona and you just glazed it over everything in life. And that is the exact opposite of how you should be because there are some situations where being Mr. Cool ain't going to serve you. Being Mr. Cool can get you killed. Being Mr. Cool can get somebody else killed. Trying to be always slow paced and always laid back, even in times of crisis, that's also a sign of emotional selfishness. <laughs> what? I had never saw it like that until she pointed at it and said, look, this, this is you. Without emotional selfishness, nobody wins. Because in times of crisis, when you're trying to be cool, calm, and collected, and under control, and act like ain't nothing happening, that signals a couple things to other parties involved. If other people are in the same situation where decisions need to be made at the drop of a dime, then you acting like nothing is happening, or you acting like you can be slow and you can lack urgency at the expense of, you know, thinking everything through and processing everything before you do it. No, it shows one, a lack of urgency. Two, it shows that you have trouble making quick decisions in times when quick decisions need to be made. Three, it shows that you take too long to process things, and sometimes only one second separates life and death. And she also dug deeper into emotional selfishness and was like, you're so guarded against being vulnerable, and that's a problem. Because vulnerability is not about being weak or being susceptible to attack or being defenseless. It's about being available and it's about being open it's about being transparent and it's about really acting on how you're feeling and sharing it and expressing it and communicating it clearly and even if you don't communicate it as clearly as you would like it's still about trying i guess it's about that immediate gut reaction to when something actually is on fire that defines your character if something is on fire what are you really about to do are you really about to stand there and process the 13 different ways and 15 other outcomes of what each decision you might make and how it all might pan out or are you going to spring the action and say okay i'm going to do this ideally you're going to do before you think for too long because over processing and indecision and mm -mm, over processing and overthinking are the enemies of productivity, efficiency and action. And she said that I've been so emotionally guarded throughout life that it just became a part of who I thought I was and who I wanted to be and maintain and project. And that was the reason for the disagreement. That was like the, the core reason for why I wasn't moving as fast as I should have been to go upstairs and get the phone to disarm the alarm. Even if I had no idea what the phones were, as soon as I heard the alarm go off, me initially kicking in the action mode as my girlfriend did saying okay where's the phones neither one of us has memorized what the actual code is to the alarm panel but i should have just sprung into action and said okay i don't know where the phones are but i'm gonna go look as fast as i can that would have avoided all of the arguments that would have avoided my girlfriend having to question her trust and my ability to act when action is needed. There's a couple key points. Urgency 
and anxiety are two different things. I did not process that until my sister pointed it out to me and until I looked back on my life and reflected on how I had really labeled and categorized anxiety and I labeled and categorized it right with urgency. I thought those went hand in hand, but in reality, no. I was fighting being an anxious person. I was fighting stress. I was fighting against being labeled as someone who's always nervous, anxious, stressed out, on edge. I was fighting that for a long time at the expense of urgency. Key point number two, vulnerability is not synonymous with weakness or defenselessness. I had always coded vulnerable as weak. That's problematic thinking. Being vulnerable is extremely important in relationships, no matter what type of relationship it is. Work, platonic, intimate, it don't matter. Being vulnerable is more helpful than it is harmful. Now, unfortunately, there are situations where being vulnerable may be taken advantage of, yet that is all situational. And that often depends on the time and place. And that's for me to figure out when I need to be vulnerable and when maybe I need to hold back just a little bit. But that comes with experience. And I gotta really understand that sometimes I won't know until I'm in it. Last key point, I have been emotionally selfish for a very long time in a variety of capacities, but emotional selfishness is also more harmful than it is helpful. Because being emotionally selfish can lead to self-destruction. Me holding in certain emotions or me refusing to show certain emotions, me refusing to tap into elements of me in a variety of situations. I'm holding myself back from feeling. In life, we're driven by feelings. We're driven by instincts. We're driven by I gut because I was not willing to open up or because I was not willing to be vulnerable or because I was not willing to share how I was feeling in certain situations that led to poor relationships, severed relationships, stagnant relationships. I definitely have friendships and relationships with some family members that just have not grown to their full potential yet. And some of that was because I was waiting for the other to put in more effort. I was waiting for the other to change how they were so they could meet me where I was. Or it wasn't until I really looked at myself and was like, yo, maybe the relationship is where it is because of your lack of effort, because of your lack of urgency, because of your lack of input, because of your lack of vulnerability. Emotional maturity, emotional intelligence can take you very far. You can go a very long way in life when you understand self-awareness. It all falls in line with unfolding my dimensions, digging into the dimensions of my life that I've curated, perfected, subdued, dampened, left untapped, refuse to develop. Like really unfolding all of that and unpacking it all and saying, yo, this is why, or this is what I've been doing all this time. And this is how it has served me, or this is how it has hindered me. So I'll leave you with this. If you intentionally unfold your dimensions, you may be surprised at what you see.